Welcome back to the Ed Morrissey Show podcast. As always on Tuesdays, we're talking with the prince of Twitter, the regent of redstate.com, Andrew Malcolm, at A.H. Malcolm on the Twitters. is Andrew uh, has got some great stuff up in the VIP column again uh, over at redstate.com. Um, lots of stuff going on um, already. Boy, this I week. guess. Yeah. Yeah, really. Yeah. It's crazy stuff. It, it's um, It's so early. Uh, as, well, we can talk about it later in the column, but it's so early, and yet it seems like it's getting late. It's a funny feeling. It is a funny feeling. It's kind of an odd feeling in terms of the um, in terms of the public. GOP presidential nomination. But you know what? Four years ago, the the Democrats were going through this, and this is about the time it started coalescing. Remember, Joe Biden didn't get into the primary until mid April. But yeah, and, but but wait, but it's. Yeah, it's a year early. No, no, it was in 2019. Remember, it's 2019, um, four years oh. ago. Okay, and, yeah. And so, um, this is everybody else but Joe Biden. I think had gotten into the race by this point in time, and some and of them Biden briefly. Was, <laughs> some of them briefly. Some of them never should have gotten in in the first place. Um, uh, Kamala Harris being the one that probably never should have gotten in in the first place, considering how bad she was at it when she got in. But um, it's interesting because Joe Biden got in. And at that point, pretty much things closed up. I don't think anybody else of significance got in after Biden declared. He kind of closed the kind of closed the window. And we're still waiting for the window to close, I think, in the Republican side. And we're talking with we're talking about Andrew's column here. Inside the 24 GOP struggle is Trump, DeSantis, Haley, and TBDs assemble early. The thing is, is that DeSantis hasn't assembled yet. I mean, we all know he's going to assemble, but he hasn't quite yet. And no, that's we, don't right. expect, we don't expect it well, until the end of May or he, middle of May. Uh, at the earliest, yeah. Uh, there's no... Uh... Well, it feels like there should be a rush, but I think one of the tricks of these things is you run it on your schedule and you don't panic and go, oh, he's in. We must get in now. Uh, he's got his legislature uh, to address until sometime next month. And presumably, they'll because it's a super majority, they'll come up with all kinds of goodies for him to run on. Um, and um, then he can he can pick his time. It seems almost certain that he's going to run. And Joe Biden. Do you remember the the movie Support Your Local Sheriff? Yes, I love that movie. With James Garner. Yeah, I loved it too. And one of the things in there, Suzanne Plachette and James Garner, and um, uh, I think it was Suzanne. Anyway, no, I think Plachette was in Support Your Local gunfighter which was the follow-up to it oh and maybe that maybe that's the one i'm thinking it was of. a different anyway. actress i can't i can't think of who the other actress was um who was in support your local well you've Shira. got a far better memory than i do uh, i watch too much tv that's why yeah. <laughs> uh but it, the the fun part of one of those movies was that james garner kept saying well they made him sheriff and he just kept saying uh, I'm only here for a little while because I'm on my way to Australia. Yes. And, and he just kept saying that. And the more he said it, the less you believed it. And that's, I think, is what's happening with Joe Biden. The more he says, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm running for sure. Uh, but uh, we pushed it off until late summer, maybe fall. Uh, there's a lot of advantages for him in doing that. Um. But, you know, you and I talked before once about uh, maybe he's going to pull a Lyndon Johnson and uh, and quit on everyone and leave them high and dry with Kamala uh, instead of hum uh, Hubert Humphrey. Well, I mean, he's gotten pretty testy about being asked about this and saying, I told you my plans, right? I mean, yeah. to the point where Jake Tapper was saying that really isn't that technically a, a declaration. He's saying he's running, you know? Yeah. You know, it's just one of those funny things. I think he's wrong. By the way, is Joan Hackett was um, support your local sheriff. It was Suzanne Plachette and support your local gunfighter, which was okay. almost as good. Support your local yeah. gunfighter was almost as good. Well, I remember Suzanne Plachette, Suzanne Plachette in her bloomers 
and James, she had a crush on Garner, and he came along. She was getting her cat out of the tree up in the front of her house. It was uh, yeah, it was cute. I like those. I miss those those kinds of movies. That those those not, were fun movies. Yeah, not a houses didn't explode too much in those. No, they didn't. Um, although in support your local gunfighter, I think. Wasn't it the local brothel that ends up exploding in that one? <laughs> Ed, I, you're amazing. I shouldn't have brought it up. You know, I, I, actually, this is a softball pitch for you to knock it out of the park. I was just citing it because the more James Garner said, I'm on my way to Australia, the less we believed him. That's right. And, and, and right. I think that's that's apt about uh, about Joe Biden, Joe Biden running. Uh well, I think it's, the takeaway on this is that I, I clearly have too much time on my hands. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know what? In the end, uh, it's all about memories anyway. So uh, I guess. Uh, make, making, <laughs> making memories. All right. All right. So let me ask you this. I mean, because the big news over the weekend, right? I mean, you wrote this piece and yeah, I mean, the TBDs are assembling, but the big news was that two of the TBDs that we really expected to see in the race decided to take a pass. Mm -hmm. Glenn Youngkin didn't surprise me so much. And he hasn't actually announced that, but he's made it clear. Two of his people are off now to work for DeSantis, who would have stuck with him if he was interested in the presidential race. Youngkin saying, I'm Basically, or at least according to the New York Times, Youngkin is saying, look, I'm focusing on the legislative race because this is the this well, is that's my... smart. That's smart yeah. because it, it, he's only got uh, uh, one term and uh, then presumably he'll challenge Warner or somebody to try to get in the Senate the way governors usually do in Virginia. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we kind of thought one term meant it'd be easier for him to run in this cycle because he wouldn't have to worry about a re-election campaign, but Yunkin hasn't really done any of the groundwork for that. We haven't seen a Yunkin pack open up. We haven't seen a Yunkin organization. Like I said, a couple of the people who were organizing for him in 2021 are now working for Ron DeSantis just recently went to Ron DeSantis or at least one of the DeSantis packs. And um, so it's pretty clear that Yunkin's not interested, but the other one was Mike Pompeo. Yeah. Now I never understood Andrew what the philosophy of a Mike Pompeo run for president was other than just Mike Pompeo wanted to run for president. Uh, because if you want a, if you want to return to the Trump administration days, you've got, you've got Donald Trump in the race. And if you mm. don't want to return to Trump, if you want a, a fresh start, you're not going to pick, you know, Donald Trump's secretary of state for that, you're going to look to DeSantis or one of the other governors, that sort of thing. People who yeah. weren't associated with the Trump administration. So I never did understand this, but this is a guy who, you know, wrote a memoir, published it in the, you know, in the, in the year that the primary, you know, uh, the, the primary starts to form up. This is what you traditionally do when you want to yeah. uh, run. In fact, Glenn Youngkin, according to, the New York Times quotes Glenn Youngkin, who still isn't saying that he's not running, but somebody apparently a reporter asked Glenn Youngkin about this, and he says, "Well, you don't see me writing a book, do you? You don't see me in Iowa or New Hampshire or, or, or <laughs> we'll forget, but South right. Carolina. I was with or South Carolina, do you? I'm in Virginia. I'm working on Virginia stuff. Um, well, Mike Pompeo wrote a book. He was in Iowa. He was in New Hampshire. He was yeah. in South Carolina." And then he decided to take a pass, which and he went and he went through that. Uh, I can only imagine uh, rigorous dieting to uh, to get that svelter body of his. Yeah, which he really and, needed to do for health reasons. Well, I mean, he needed to do it for health, but he also that was a pretty clear sign to me that he was thinking about running. Yep, you know, and this is why I say uh, his not running is more like you said is more important than Youngkin not running because to my mind it indicates why bother uh this isn't the time this isn't the time for him like you say he's associated with Trump um so maybe he'll go off and uh, earn a bunch of money and uh speaking and for some big corporation and make a name there and then and then come back uh because um 
Trump is the elephant in the living room, and he's he's he lined up uh, today. He announced he lined up almost the entire Tennessee Republican uh, congressional delegation, both senators yeah. and most of the House members, and um, uh, it just uh, it seems like he's doing more organizing behind the scenes than I expected him to and that he had before. So um, I I just wish he would um, tone it down with the names and stuff, but that's him. Yeah. You know, um, I, I, I what I think is that everybody's just positioning themselves now for a kickoff and it's not going to happen until Santos gets in the race. DeSantis is still busy, however, and that brings us to one of the big stories as we're speaking on Monday today, Monday afternoon, which was um, Ron DeSantis uh, announcing the next round of the Disney versus Florida fight. Um, now, I actually watched the press conference, right? I watched slash listened to because it was I was doing different things. So I, I would flash back eyeballing it, but I was listening to it as it was going on. and. Um, I was actually surprised how little of this was culture war based until until the state representative got up. And that changed the whole tone of this. Carolina Amnesty. State Representative Carolina Amnesty. How's that for a name? That's a great name. It's, it doesn't it's a great fit in name. the headline. Doesn't fit in the headlines, but it's a great name. C A. Yeah. yeah. Carolina Amnesty. Um uh really went off on Disney being a woke corporation, indoctrinating children, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But for for DeSantis, and there was a commissioner there and another legislative leader, I think, in the state Senate, um, who was sponsoring a bill to undo the Reedy Creek district after and this is part of a whole series of legal machinations. Yeah. You know, the legislature voided out. Uh, or, or removed the the five previous commissioners of the Reedy Creek Tax District, and uh, DeSantis appointed them. But before the previous ones left, they somehow ceded the their authority to the Disney Corporation for uh, basically in perpetuity, as long as there were descendants of Ch King Charles the Third around. <laughs> <laughs> or I'm sorry, King Charles the Second. I mean, they copied something from from British corporate law, which was as long as there are descendants of King Charles II alive, this covenant will remain in place, which is absurd. I mean, this whole I mean, it was a deliberate thumb in the eye to yeah. the Florida state legislature and to DeSantis. And I'm not even sure what the purpose of it was. Had they just shut up and, and tried to engage with them quietly? <laughs> They probably would have ended up with some policies that were not quite as friendly as the previous set of policies, but with Disney still having some sort of um, autonomy within that tax district. Well, <laughs> that's coming to a screeching halt, according to DeSantis and the legislature. They're about to they're about to pass a whole bunch of different laws that is going to end up undoing any autonomy they have there. Um, especially when it comes to appraisals for property taxes, things like inspections of rides at Disneyland <laughs> and, um, and the use of state lands around uh, Disneyland because the state owns some land in that district. It's not just Disney's land there. And <laughs> this press conference, and I know, uh, Andrew, you didn't get a chance to watch this, but his press conference, DeSantis sort of semi suggested that the state might find some room there to um, provide some badly needed um, uh, uh, capacity for their penal system. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> putting a state prison next to Disneyland. Disney you know, World, yeah. Disney World, Disney World. I'm sorry, Disney World. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure the state of Florida is not going to do that. That would be. That would really be cutting off your nose to spite your face because they do. You know, the state of Florida gets a lot of taxes out of that too. Oh yeah, it's amazing. But, uh, it's amazing, and it's it's become so expensive. Yeah, I was talking with somebody that took his family, and he said it was like a large family, but he said it was like two grand to get in. Yes, yes, yeah. 
I, I will tell you this myself. I was there last year, right? Uh, um, but it had to be somewhere combined up around um, at least two thousand dollars, maybe more than that, to to get a um, to get a uh, a suite at, at one of the parks, so that we could. And, and the intent of this was actually to go to um, Cape Canaveral. Because mm. my father worked in the space yeah. industry, he used to go right. out there and work from time to time, and you know, just for a nostalgic trip, he could go back and see it. By the way, and I, I'm pretty sure Andrew, you already, you've probably been there at least once. I would highly recommend that. I mean, whether oh, or not you're it's, it's an Disney amazing, world. an amazing place. It's I was, so I was, I was among the few young Americans who got up early to to watch the uh, aborted launches of john glenn and and alan shepherd and uh grissom it, it it was uh in the early days of the space project so when you go back there now you see the beginning and the end and yeah. it's an amazing place absolutely they have a uh what do they call it uh what's that big screen um where you go in and it's an immersive experience. Uh, oh, IMAX. Oh, IMAX. IMAX. Yeah. yeah. They, have, they, yeah. IMAX they, they have an IMAX that, that when I was there, they did a launch and it was you know, all quiet with birds flying around and then the launch and the sound and all that. And I actually convinced my bosses at the LA Times in 2011 to send me back, back. I mean, as if I, I visited before, but to send me for the last shuttle launch, the Atlantis, and what an that. and yeah. what an amazing experience! Uh, absolutely amazing. They got us up as close as you can get to it, and then you're three miles away for the launch. And I just, uh, it's just to see, <laughs> just to experience it and the sound. Uh, I mean, you know, when the they they tell you. There, as he said, there will be a million pictures. Don't waste your time taking your own pictures because they won't be as good as the pros. And just enjoy the experience, which I, I took one, but which is true. But when it launches, and of course it's three miles away, so you don't hear it at first. You see the, the steam coming out from the immense amount of water they put in. Not for heat, by the way, but they put it in to dampen the sound. Down, dampen the sound. They, yeah. they almost lost the first Enterprise launch because the sound tilted at six degrees. Got back in time for the launch. But uh, anyway, you see the steam coming out, and then it starts to lift off, and then you hear the sound. And when it clears the tower, you can actually feel a, a little heat on your face. I mean, it's three miles. Uh, the first uh, Enterprise shuttle pilot, uh, forgot his name now, but he he said that the NASA insisted on putting an ejection seat in the Enterprise. And he said, you know, I, I told him, I said, it's, first of all, nobody's going to use it. But second, I mean, it was just for PR. Oh, well, if something goes wrong, they can eject. Eject into a million degree exhaust of, of all those of all those engines, and you don't turn them off, is one of the other astronauts told me. He said, once you light those solid fuel boosters, you're going somewhere, yep. and uh, you better hope it's the right place. It's uh, yeah. anyway, I I agree with you. It's a, uh, an amazing visit. Well, yeah, it's an amazing visit. Now the the question here is is why this fight is continuing, right? Yeah, I think that. And I've gotten some blowback on this from people who say this is a First Amendment issue. Disney spoke up in favor of a particular polit political position, and DeSantis has been retaliating against them, which I think is a it's a defensible argument right up until the time that Disney tried to um, sneak in that new covenant, <laughs> which yeah. basically allowed it to set its own tax rates and um, and exempted its um, rides from any sort of state inspection. Uh, I think that I, I think that up until that point, they may have had a little, <laughs> bit, of the, yeah. a little bit of the, um, yeah, that, that wasn't going to fly. The, well, the King well, Chuck and the, the, thing isn't going to fly. Stockholders, and the stockholders, I mean, it, it, Disney stock took a hit. Why? Yeah. I don't under, this is, this is the, uh, the head of Disney. And was it Chaffick? 
who who got fired. So he's gone. Yeah, but this is I, Iger. This happened under Iger. This yeah, thing. but Pretty Iger creepy. is trying to put things back together, but he's got to be aggressive. And um, he's the guy that brought him all the much, much financial success. So, yeah, it seems to be an unnecessary an unnecessary fight. And just shut your mouth and run your business. You know, I mean, I understand they have a huge gay community among employees and like woke employees. And like at the New York Times, they revolted and made the editors change their mind about the um, um, what's the Arkansas senator's name about his op ed. Tom and Cotton. Yeah, Tom Cotton. Yeah. Tom Cotton. Yeah. And to change his mind about that it was a good thing. Uh, but bottom line is people who own the stock in it are not interested in, uh, in companies uh, taking stands that cost them a fortune. Yeah. And this is going to end up costing them a fortune. Um, yeah. and again, if they had just let well enough alone and if Iger had come in and, and tried to reset things and, and, and start dealing, you know, back channel with the state of Florida, try to try to calm things down, probably would have been a, a return to the status quo ante probably would have been, uh, possible. It's certainly not possible anymore. So, no. yeah. And it, it, this kind of reminds me of the Budweiser thing, which, you know, <laughs> oh, yeah. To me, you know, I get, I, I actually think that the whole thing with Budweiser was a little overblown. I'm sure transgender people like beer too. And there's nothing wrong with pitching beer at, 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 at the transgender community. There's nothing wrong with, with pitching Jack Daniels whiskey at the at transgender um, community. Now we can debate that. That's debatable and people can be offended by that. I, I get that and that's fine. For me, it was far more offensive for Nike to hire Dylan Mulvaney as a spokesperson for its women's athletic gear because <laughs> what it, hey, because of the manner in the manner in which he was promoting it, which with that silly girl face video that he was doing that was just ridiculous and very um patronizing of actual women athletes who you know, do have been fighting for decades against the idea of running like a girl and hitting like a girl and throwing like a girl. And there you get Dylan Mulvaney basically doing a, a stereotype of all of that to promote a sports bra for women. That to me is offensive. The, the stuff with the beer is just silly. Um, but that being said, <laughs> they're not really... They're, they they haven't figured out that the, the best thing to do in this thing would be just say hey look that we screwed it us we screwed it up we're just not going to do it again um they 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 released this new national ad did you see the national ad yeah which is this you know the Clydesdales the running through are. America I uh, love the Clydesdales but um yeah so there was a there was a parody ad that came out I think yesterday I, I posted up in the headlines today which was really funny um that basically. Um, um, uh, basically completely deconstructed this ad. Um, and it starts off by saying, um, I'm a Clydesdale, but I identify as a reindeer. Call me. Prancer. <laughs> <laughs> and then it deconstructs the whole, the whole Budweiser ad. It's, it's a very funny thing, but you know, this is another instance where, Budweiser took a five billion dollar hit to its valuation. InBev, I should say, because InBev is is the Belgian company that owns it. Um, they took a five billion dollar hit to their valuation over this because people just stopped drinking the beer. And and again, we can argue over whether that was an overreaction. I think it kind of was, but it's part of the reason why people. Well, it doesn't overreacted. matter. It, yeah, it doesn't matter when you get into these games. You remember. Um, Back in the 90s, George H.W. Bush visited a grocery store. And Andrew Rosenthal of the New York Times was the pool reporter. And Bush, this is a photo op, and Bush went behind the counter and said to the guy, as any politician would, so how does this work? This was when scanners were new. And Andrew Rosenthal wrote, 
that he didn't know about scanners because he was a, an aloof politician and blah, blah, blah. Um, and he, of course, it, it's what happens often with this media uh, is they take one little thing and distort it. Now, the Dylan, uh, the, the beer can, uh, that was just a commemorative small release of beer cans made it sound like yeah. these were going to be the cans all over the shelf and you were going to have to, if you're going to have Bud Light, you're going to have to drink out of this guy's can. Um, Hershey's, you know, they, they did a small limited thing with the Hers with the SHE of Hershey for right. transgender month and all that. I don't, I don't understand that, that the market is that big that you have to uh, kowtow to them, but, that much but I, well that's that's my thing it, it, is that the transgender community is at best 0.6 percent the demographic i should say is 0.6 percent of the overall population that's the current estimate even after all of this stuff only 0.6 percent of people identify as transgender and even then <laughs> probably most of them aren't you know hardcore activists for this type of thing anyway so the problem with Budweiser and then Nike, I think, has much bigger problems. But the problem with Budweiser and, and, and Hershey's and, is that they're going out of their way to pander to that particular uh, mm -hmm. demographic. And the way it feels to the rest of us is lecturing us on not just you should tolerate this, but you should not just accept it, but you should um, uh, celebrate it or else, you know, you're a bigot. Right. That's right. the. That's the that's the way it's being received by the ninety nine yeah. or at least a good chunk of the ninety nine percent of the rest of their demographic, uh, you know, or their market, I should say, right? And and that's a huge problem. And the reason why it's backfiring on Bush is because Anheuser Bush is because people are sick and tired of being lectured about this. And yeah. there's an awful lot of lecturing going on with this Biden crowd. That's for sure. Well. And then it brings us to another thing, <laughs> which is, you know, you've got this, this, you know, anger with Anheuser Busch, and you actually have it looks like some sort of, uh, at least tacit acknowledgement of the problem from Anheuser Busch. I don't know that we've seen that from Nike yet. Nike deserves a lot more, I think, than Anheuser Busch does. But you've got, of all people. <laughs> Donald Trump Jr. coming out and saying, stop boycotting Anheuser-Busch. They contribute to the, they contribute to the RNC. <laughs> it's like, wow, I never would have expected a really establishment-y response <laughs> from no. the Trumps. I mean, I don't really care if they donate to the RNC because they are also donating to the DNC. And they're doing that for, you know, for reason, political yeah, reasons. Right. Yeah. So it's make sure that they have their ass covered both ways. It's not that's not a commitment. Well, and actually, Donald Trump did that with his political donations as a businessman. Absolutely, and it's a smart move as a businessman to do that. But I mean, then to have Donald Trump Jr. come out and start scolding conservatives for for you know boycotting to the you know I forgot about that Ed. That's a <laughs> that's a good point. Jeez, it's 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 tone deaf, right? And. This is, I mean, what you're seeing, this reaction to Anheuser-Busch is really a populist reaction. And the Trumps are supposed to be the sine qua non, you know, of a populist, you know, right-leaning populist, conservative populist uh, right. politicians. They really missed the boat on this to the, almost oh, the same did, extent yeah. that Anheuser-Busch yeah. did. Yeah, but then Trump goes to the, what was it, the martial arts fight, and he got a huge response to the, from that crowd. Oh, sure. I mean, this is Donald Trump Jr. I'm talking about. This yeah, no, I know. But yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I'm, I don't want to lay this off on Donald Trump Sr., but I mean, the family, I mean, Don Don Jr. is has been part of the, you know, the oh, family. Oh, yeah, crowd. absolutely. Surprisingly so, and, and enthusiastically so. Yeah, exactly. So anyway, so those are the, those are the big stories this week so far. Um, well. What's your thinking you also, on the draft, Ed, on the NFL draft? That's my thinking it. on the NFL draft is, please don't televise this damn thing. I mean, honestly, guys. 
I actually, I have no thoughts on the NFL draft. I just, I, I'm not okay, that. There's the headline, folks. <laughs> Ed Morrissey disses NFL. I will tell you this, though. Speaking of drafts, did you see that the NBA fined the Dallas Mavericks seven hundred fifty thousand dollars for tanking a game so it could stay in the uh, in the um, uh, draft lottery? <laughs> it's like, well, wasn't there? There was talk about the Dolphins doing that too, but I don't think yeah. I'm not sure whether they got fined. Um, I think it was. I think it would have been tougher to prove with the Dolphins because the rest of the team was still playing pretty much the same level they had been and, um uh to a um i can't think of i can't remember how to pronounce his last name but their starting quarterback was out and i think their second string or was out at one point as well with um concussion injuries so it's a little tough tough to lay that but i mean i guess the mavericks dallas mavericks were just really bad at tanking it they made it so obvious that the league had to do something but my my question to you would be the league set those incentives, right? With this whole draft lottery yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you set the incentives, how can you find a team for responding to the incentives? I get that they made a mockery out of the game and they really screwed the fans that showed up for this. <laughs> in, in other words, in other words, you got to be better at faking it. Yeah. <laughs> or, or we'll find you. And besides which. I mean, a seven hundred fifty thousand dollar fine is is no joke. And uh, to prove it, the NBA can send me the seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. I will be happy to say how, how much that money actually is in real in real terms. Yeah, that's well, a good point. A I'm good not going to I'm not going to claim it's a joke, but <laughs> the upside of a high uh, lottery pick, a high draft lottery pick, outweighs that considerably. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the, the proper punishment for that would be to deny them access to the to the to the lottery draft um because the nba does it weird i mean other sports the draft goes to the team in in last place um and there's tiebreakers in case there's a tie for that and that sort of thing um but the nba i guess they got tired of of the tanking games at some point i'm trying to remember <clears throat> dimly in my memory how they did this and they decided to set up like a lottery draft so that the yeah. last the bottom 10 teams can compete or, or or not even compete it's a it's a drawing to see who gets the first you the know the nh the nhl did that and that's how Sidney crosby went to pittsburgh um okay. they drew they drew their name the the like you say the the bottom worst teams yeah well i'm not and and then uh six billion for the redskins or I'm sorry, the commanders, the commies, the Washington commies. commies the most, yeah, that's, that's what I call them, the Washington commies. I think it yeah. fits. Jeez, you know the the best thing about that is that Magic Johnson's finally going to be an NFL owner. He's a he's a minor, well, minority. He's, he's, a, he's in the Dodgers, isn't he? In the Lakers, he's in yeah. everything, and he runs he's that. Not, uh, but not the NFL. This is this is going to be the first time he's going to get an yeah. ownership position in the NFL. So. He's in, and he's an owner of Fat Burger. I love Magic Johnson. I, 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 I mean, you grew up in L.A. Even if you weren't a basketball fan, you just loved Magic, Magic Johnson. The guy was just incredible. Uh, he was in his, magic. He was magic, right? Really was magic. Um, totally upbeat guy. Has clearly had to overcome an awful lot in his life with the AIDS diagnosis, HIV diagnosis, I should say, and um, and has really, you know, not just persevered, but he's thrived um it's been yeah. 30 years right it's been is that right 30 years. it's been more wow. than 30 years since he got that diagnosis i think it was 90 or 91 when he wow. got that diagnosis That's... so i'm happy to see him achieving his goals i know that our politics are different but this is a guy who's you know his politics might be different but he's investing his own money in places like south central los angeles which you don't call south central los angeles <laughs> anymore they got rid of that name but he was investing in businesses there. He was investing in community uh, issues there. Um, so, I, I, you know, to me, it's like, first off, I think Dan Snyder is a scumbag anyway. So I'm happy to see him go. But I'm glad that if anybody's going to get the get the bid on that, it would be that Magic would be part of it. So congratulations to, to Magic. Yeah, so. you've got to be pretty rich. And the, the Browns owner just bought a piece of a Milwaukee book. And uh, 
There's a lot of if you got if you got the money, uh, there's a lot of that cross ownership. The good news is that Condi Rice is one of the owners of the Broncos. I That's hate right. the. I hate the Broncos, but uh, she's one of the owners. And she's I like the Broncos. She used to, when I, I worked with her on the first Bush campaign, and she would always say, or people would ask reporters, what, what would be your ideal job? And they were thinking, you know, Secretary of State, which she was eventually. But, and she said, well, I'd like to be the NFL commissioner. <laughs> but the bonanza that Roger Goodell has brought the owners there is uh, – yeah, it's going to be hard to top for a uh, competitor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, it's and Hugh wants the uh, stadium re- uh, revamp. By the way, I don't know if you saw that earlier on Twitter. Who does? Cleveland, Cleveland. He wants the Cleveland uh, Browns stadium revamped. Revamped, yeah, because it's what twenty years old. Twenty five. It's twenty five well, years old. They just dumped the owner. I mean, the uh, the name, the owner of the naming rights. They got yes. rid of them. Yes. I don't, so. I don't. Uh, it, it, it's like rich people. You remember that ad for the, the limousine would pull up and the back window would go down and the man would say, do you have any gray poupon? Yes. Uh, yes. And this is, this is their issues. I, I, I just kind of like watch with interest. Rich people, rich people. Uh, uh, it's rich good to be rich. Interest. It's good to be king. It's good to be good king. to be king. It's good to be king. All right. Well, I think that's going to wrap it up for today, except for the jokes of the week. I don't actually have any jokes on hand. Oh, oh, I know. I, okay. I didn't do my did not do my homework. I am going to be looking for jokes while you're while you're on. No, you're, I had some new ones, but I don't know where they went. Uh, uh, let's see here. Um. Jimmy Fallon said, a uh, new study says procrastinating can be passed from generation to generation. I asked my father about that, and he said he'd been meaning to tell me. <laughs> uh, uh, let's see. Let's see. Well, uh, 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 Letterman, he said that uh, President Obama filled out his census form. This would have been 2010. And I feel bad for the guy. Like he needs another reminder that he lives with his mother-in-law. <laughs> she lived in there for eight years. Um, well, anyway. Uh, the... Um, uh, finally, Jimmy Fallon, he said, did you watch, this is obviously some years ago, did you watch the NCAA basketball championship game? 53 to 41. Lowest scoring game ever. I, it was so boring, the Jumbotron switched over to Dancing with the Stars. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I got a couple for you that I dug up. Oh, okay, all right. All right. Let's Courtesy of, the laugh, uh, of laughfactory.com, I dug up a couple here. The child asked his father, how were people born? So his father said, well, Adam and Eve made babies, then their babies became adults and made babies and so on. The child then went to his mother and asked her the same question. She told him, well, we were evolved from monkeys and we evolved to uh, become like we are now. The child read back to his father and said, you lied to me. His father replied, no, no, no. Your mother was talking about her side of the family. (laughs) (laughs) All right. One more. One more. This is another one that's going to be guaranteed to get me in trouble. The wife asked her husband, how would you describe me? The husband says, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K. And she goes, what in the world does that mean? And he says, well, adorable, beautiful, cute, de- uh, delightful, elegant, fashionable, gorgeous, and hot. And she says, ah, that's nice. But, but what about I, J, K? And he says, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, that's a good one. I, J, K. Yeah. I, J, K. Don't add the IJK, gentlemen. Leave it out. Yeah. Leave out right. the IJK and you're golden. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. Stop at H. I implore <laughs> you. All right. All right. Oh, that's <laughs> Andrew good. Malcolm, of course, the prince of Twitter. He always knows to stop at H. That's what I say. <laughs> Andrew and H. Malcolm. Yeah. Andrew right. H. Malcolm. There you go. 
A at A H Malcolm. So it's A to H. You can remember this now. I didn't even think about this. A to H Malcolm. A H Malcolm <laughs> on Twitter. <laughs> and of course, the region of Red State, redstate.com. Andrew, thanks so much. We'll talk again next week. Okay, buddy. Thanks, everybody. See you then. Now that the political infighting is over and the sausage is being made in the House, it's time for Republicans to unite with one cause and fight back against Joe Biden and his radical administration. The GOP has promised to investigate Biden family corruption, the border, big tech censorship collusion, the origins of COVID, the FBI, and intel agencies' attacks on the American people and more, and it's time to hold them to those promises. Here at Hot Air, we won't let up on holding them accountable. We unapologetically fight back against the radical left and squishy rhinos in Congress who fail the people. We bring you the truth and go to war against Biden's woke communist agenda. But we need your help. By becoming a VIP for uh, hotair.com, you can help us in this battle for our country. Just look at the House Democrats leader, Hakeem Jeffries. He's another divisive, radical leftist, and his communist Sesame Street speech proves it. If Republicans don't halt the Biden agenda and conservative media fails to hold them accountable, it could mean the end of our great country. Join us in the fight. Become a Hot Air VIP member or a VIP Gold member today and use the promo code SAVEAMERICA to receive a 40% discount on your membership. Stand with us and fight to save America. We will never give up. And thank you very much.